Ovulation induction for PCOS. What are your treatment options and what you need to know? Hi friends, I am Dr. Natalie Crawford. I am a board certified OBGYN and REI. And today I am talking about ovulation injection. And specifically, I'm talking about this for PCOS or polycystic ovarian syndrome. We are going to review Clomid, Femora, and Metformin, and what you need to know about why we may use these treatments and what they mean. One of the top questions I get asked all the time is how can I make myself ovulate naturally if I have PCOS? I think it's really important to understand that treating PCOS is a combination of lifestyle modification in addition to very often medical management for ovulation induction. There is nothing wrong with you if you can't ovulate without medical help. I sometimes see in the PCOS communities that there is this idea that if you can't get your lifestyle good enough to ovulate on your own, that you're doing something wrong. And there's a lot of blame, both from some of the fertility community and internally. And there are some people who can have the healthiest lifestyle on earth, and they're not gonna ovulate with their PCOS without medical help. So it's not a failure, but you should understand what treatments are out there and what do they mean and why we talk about them. If you like the channel, I am here to talk about fertility education. Would love it if you would subscribe and follow along. Before we dive in, quick overview. So PCOS is polycystic ovarian syndrome. I like to talk about this in my analogy. If you imagine you have a vault inside your ovary that has all your eggs. Each month, a group of eggs is released from the vault. Normally, the brain will send out FSH, which is follicle stimulating hormone, which will stimulate one of these eggs. Each egg grows inside a follicle. That follicle will grow, ovulate, the egg will be released, and the rest of the eggs will die in the next month, a new group. When you have PCOS, and I have a whole video on it, what I really want you to think about is essentially having your eggs stuck. They kind of have a lot of eggs that are released from the vault at one time. This confuses the brain. So the brain sends out the normal signal of FSH and it's not strong enough. Think about it getting dispersed amongst all those other follicles so it doesn't ovulate and you get stagnant. And then because the ovary loves to make hormones, it starts having the pathway to make testosterone, which is stimulated by LH, another pituitary hormone, and that pathway becomes much easier. And then that leads to some of the other symptoms that we can see, which can be acne, hair growth, abdominal weight gain, difficulty losing weight, insulin resistance, and more. So what happens is when the FSH signal from the brain is not strong enough, you get halted in that pattern and you're not reliably ovulating. Now, sometimes you will. Month to month, there could be huge variation. So sometimes you will get a egg to ovulate. Maybe you had fewer release from the vault that month. Maybe the brain randomly sent out more FSH. So there is some variability. One of the hallmarks of the disease is irregular periods. And so what we mean by that is a period that does not come in a regular and predictable fashion. If you have regular predictable periods, that is the number one sign that you are ovulating. You might still have PCOS. Maybe it is being controlled as best as possible by your lifestyle and your stress. And maybe you're one of those lucky people who can control it lifestyle wise. Maybe you recently came off birth control pills because birth control pills can help treat PCOS. They lower your testosterone levels. So when you come off the pill, sometimes people will ovulate for a few cycles and then they space out and they stop. But if we want to diagnose PCOS, the diagnostic criteria is something called the Rotterdam criteria. You can actually just need two out of three to get the diagnosis. So if you have hormonally related acne and irregular periods, you've already met the diagnostic criteria for PCOS. What we're going to go over right now is some of the treatment options that we have to help rectify your periods and what studies tell us. What I'm gonna go over in just a minute are two of the biggest studies that help us understand what treatment options we have for ovulation induction. Before we dive into that, number one, I like to think of PCOS as almost imagine your diseases on a teeter-totter and there'll be times of your life where it gets better and times that it gets worse. Your physical phenotype, meaning your body type, can be really different. So I have very thin patients with PCOS and I have overweight patients with PCOS. So do not think that just because you look a certain way, you do or do not have the disease. This is a disease of ovarian dysfunction, just like all kinds of other organs in your body don't always work, and so don't have self-blame. But things that we know from a lifestyle factor. So let's 
dive into quick lifestyle knowledge that we know for PCOS, and then we'll touch base on methods for ovulation injection with medical treatment. Lifestyle modifications. So number one is going to be, if you are overweight, losing weight, even losing as little as 5% of your body weight can sometimes restore ovulation. That's because some of our fat cells make a different type of estrogen. This estrogen confuses the brain, so the brain won't send out a strong enough signal of FSH. Lose the weight, that peripheral estrogen lowers, and then the brain may kick on again. Absolutely, this is not a case if you are thin with PCOS or underweight or have a normal BMI. There are some dietary modifications that we've seen in studies that can help. So the biggest one was in the nurse's health study. So one is that eating more protein that comes from vegetable sources over animal sources. So things like beans, lentils, tofu can be helpful for you when it comes to ovulating. So people who ate those more tended to ovulate more on their own versus people who had more animal-based sources of proteins. Similarly, diets high in fruits, vegetables, and fiber and whole grains was beneficial. So thinking through that normal, you know, healthy, plant-based, whole foods diet is going to be the best for you. So less sugar, less processed foods. We want to avoid toxins from the environment. So think about things like plastics and packaging and chemicals, maybe on your makeup or in your products and modify those where you can. And we want to try to mitigate stress to the best way that we can possible. And this is going to be really important with PCOS because the brain is going to be really sensitive to your external environment. If you come to me and you don't have regular periods, number one, we're going to start to look for a reason why. So that is key. Somebody who just says, oh, this is PCOS without checking that it's not actually your thyroid a prolactin abnormality or something else is just making an assumption. So I would say the two things you must rule out, first of all, is going to be a thyroid and a prolactin abnormality. The next thing is that depending on how profound your absence of periods is, you need to make sure that's actually PCOS and not your brain not sending out FSH. So you can have hypothalamic amenorrhea, and this is where the brain doesn't send out enough FSH or any at all, therefore you can't ovulate. So it's not really a ovary issue in that circumstance. It's a brain issue and the treatment is going to be very different. So number one, you need to make sure the diagnosis is accurate. Number two, if you're trying to get pregnant, I'm a huge believer that we should check everything so that we can have all the data that we need. The reason why is I can make you ovulate all the time in the world, but if your tubes are blocked or there's no sperm, we're not going to be able to get where we want to get. And it's going to be really frustrating, especially if you're spending your most valuable commodity, which is your time, trying to get pregnant. Okay, but presuming you have an actual diagnosis, you do not ovulate, everything else is fine, let's try to make you ovulate. So let's talk about one of the hallmark studies that if you are an OBGYN resident or a student or an REI, you're gonna be quizzed on this. And if you're a patient, you should at least know where this data comes from. So this was a landmark paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2007. Clomiphene metformin or both for infertility for polycystic ovarian syndrome. So in this study, what they did is they gave people Clomid or they gave people metformin or they gave people Clomid and metformin together. And these were people who had PCOS. So let's talk about Clomid real quick. Clomid is clomiphene. It's something called a CIRM, a selective estrogen receptor modulator. Essentially what it does is it binds to your estrogen receptors in the brain. And then your brain thinks, oh my gosh, there's no estrogen around. And so what does it do in turn? It sends out FSH because it is wired to send out FSH in relation to how much estrogen it interprets. So when the brain doesn't see any estrogen, it's going to send out more FSH. Again, this is for PCOS. So if you have hypothalamic amenorrhea and I give you Colmid, nothing's going to happen because your brain is not sending out FSH already in a low estrogen environment. So this is for PCOS. So if I block the brain, you take Colmid usually for five days. It can start anywhere in the first five days of the cycle, last for five days. Now suddenly you're not going to have any estrogen and your brain's going to freak out thinking you're in menopause. So what are the common symptoms of Colmid? Hot flashes, headaches, mood swings. I mean, people hate Clomid because it's like being in menopause all of a sudden and you're a young reproductive age person, you shouldn't be in menopause. But regardless, it then sends out that high signal of FSH, which hopefully will be a strong enough signal to get an egg to start growing. That is the premise behind Clomid. Metformin is a bigonide. It's a medication used for diabetes or insulin resistance, and it can sometimes be helpful for people with PCOS. So as a bigonide, what it does is it decreases gluconeogenesis or the production of new glucose. It makes the body more sensitive so your other tissues become more sensitive to glucose and it also helps decrease 
production of androgens in the ovaries. And that is why it entered into the discussion because that ovarian androgen production and insulin resistance are really tightly tied together. So that is metformin. There have been studies showing that metformin can help people ovulate with PCOS alone. So this was a really good randomized controlled trial to compare them and look at combination treatment to see if that could be helpful. So this is the chart showing the results. So ovulation is actually ovulating, conception is getting a positive pregnancy test, and pregnancy is having a pregnancy on ultrasound inside the uterus. So the clomid group, let's just go down to pregnancy, which is the outcome we can all say means the most. So 23.9% of people in the clomid group got pregnant, 8.7% of the people in the metformin group got pregnant, and 31.1% of the people in the combined group got pregnant. Now, when we look at statistical significance and power and you compare these groups, there was no statistical difference between the clomid and the clomid plus metformin, meaning they had statistically the same likelihood of working. However, they were both superior to metformin alone. My takeaway from this is that metformin is a good adjunct. It can be used for some people, especially if everything else is normal. You don't want to do ovulation induction. Just starting metformin may help you get to a pregnancy, although it is not likely going to. Now, is it going to harm you to be on metformin and clomid together? No. But if you can't tolerate metformin, is it going to be essential to have metformin in addition to your Clomid? No, meaning those two things are equal statistically. Truly, the pregnancy or the live birth is the outcome that matters the most. It takes longer to get there, so it's harder to study that, but it's a very important piece of data. And so even though that pregnancy data looks really enticing, when we look at the live birth data, the live birth rate in the Clomid only group was 22.5%. The live birth rate in the metformin group was 7.2%. And the live birth rate in the combined group was 26.8%. So that is why the conclusion is that there's no statistical significance for live birth between Clomid and Clomid plus metformin. Now, let's look at another study that changed the way that we practiced. And this one is letrozole versus clomiphene for infertility in the polycystic ovarian syndrome. So in this study, we compared clomiphene to letrozole, which is also known as Femara. Now, letrozole or Femara, what letrozole does is it is an aromatase inhibitor. So it actually inhibits the production of estrogen that's circulating around, like in your periphery. It eats it up is the easiest way to think about it. So now you have less free circulating estrogen. So if you start taking letrozole, the brain now senses a decrease in the amount of circulating estrogen, not fully blocked like Clomid, but a decrease. And then it will subsequently send out a signal of FSH and see if that will get you to ovulate. So this was a newer type of medication as compared to Clomid. It works differently. It has fewer side effects. So people who are taking letrozole do not complain about the same side effects as you have with Clomid. And one of the negative things about Clomid that we didn't mention before is that the inside of the uterus has some estrogen receptors. We all know that the lining responds to estrogen. And so in some people, when you take a serum or a selective estrogen receptor modulator, you're actually blocking the estrogen receptors inside the uterus and you can get a thin lining as one of the side effects of from Clomid that could be detrimental. So looking at letrozole for PCOS, let's see what this study showed us. So if we're going to just target it on that live birth rate, since we already said that's the outcome that matters the most, we're going to see that the live birth rate in the clomiphene group was 19.1%. The live birth rate in the letrozole group was 27.5%. So significantly higher for women with PCOS who used letrozole as a method for ovulation induction instead of Clomid. So interestingly in the study, they did a sub-analysis where they looked at the chance of letrozole being more beneficial than Clomid based on your BMI. And if your BMI was 30 or less, they were really closely the same. So either treatment probably would be fine. However, as your BMI went up, letrozole became more beneficial over Clomid. And we can see that in this group that said BMI between 30 to 39 and then the BMI over 39.4. Another interesting point, however, is that both of those groups have lower, these are all on the same y-axis. So they actually had lower rates of live birth than that more normal or mildly overweight category versus these obese groups. So if you do weigh more, 
even in the context of using letrozole, you are still having a lower chance of it working than if you are closer to a normal weight. Okay, so this was a very fast overview of two big studies. One that showed using metformin for every patient doesn't really provide a benefit versus Clomid alone. And then a follow-up study showing that letrozole is superior to Clomid for PCOS. And so that's now standard of care. If you come in and you need ovulation induction, you carry a diagnosis of PCOS, that letrozole is typically the first line option. Some caveats, there's different doses. It does take time to figure out the dose that works and you may not find a dose that truly works for you. Again, we are modifying estrogen and how the brain interprets estrogen. The brain has to therefore do its job in order to respond appropriately. And I have patients with PCOS that I call very refractory and I can't get them to respond to oral medications. Sometimes using injectable hormones like FSH can be an option, but that carries significant risks of high order multiples and over response or over hyperstimulation. Most of us practice where if you can't ovulate with oral medications, you might want to consider going on to IVF because that's going to be a safer option for you to get pregnant with less risks. However, that's a conversation to have with your doctor. Again, this is PCOS. So we use ovulation injection medications for unexplained infertility coupled with an IUI all the time. And I'm not saying that this data represents data there. This is specifically looking at a group of patients with PCOS. I've been promising y'all an episode of PCOS Q and A's. I will do a live episode coming up soon. So stay tuned so you can come on and ask your questions. Thank you so much for following and supporting the channel. You can always follow along, listen to the As A Woman podcast for more fertility-related information, or follow me on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD. Thanks, friends. <laughs>